Thank you. Um, well, my presentation is a bit of a shameless plug for um, a new book that I've got coming out in September. Um, but I also want to um, talk about possible areas for collaboration um, in the whole area of environmental communication. It's an area um, where there's a diverse range of, of researchers working um, on um, issues ranging from human geography, political science, psychology, sociology, media and journalism studies. Um, but we haven't been so good as a, a, a field um, in terms of collaborating with natural scientists or with stakeholders, and that's something that really needs to kind of uh, move forward. Um, so just to give you some overview of, of the book that I've got coming out in um, September, which is called um, Media Environment and the Network Society by um, Palgrave, <coughs> published by Palgrave Macmillan. Um, the book essentially is about media and power, and it's looking at how things have shifted over recent decades. Um, and what you find is that most um, research in the past tended to concentrate, and my own research as well, on um, traditional media, particularly on elite newspapers and how they frame um, environmental issues like climate change. Um, and they didn't focus very much on um, tabloid newspapers, which obviously have the, the widest uh, circulation. Um, and what we know is that particularly in um, the States, the climate change um, skeptic think tanks have been quite successful in sowing the seeds of doubt about climate change. Um, the book isn't just about climate change, but that's what I'm going to concentrate on um, today. Um, you know, and you see these kind of headlines um, in papers like the Mail, the Express. I don't know if we have any readers here of The Spectator. Um, but there was a, an issue, I don't know if people remember, that came out um, at the end of 2013 where Matt Ridley was suggesting that actually we should be happy um, about climate change because it's, you know, in many ways it's a good thing. Um, and he was claiming that with um, climate change we're going to have um, better agricultural yields, we're going to have... Um, less people um, dying in winter because it will be warmer and um, that there will be fewer droughts. Um, so some, some rather strange claims there. Um, but there's no doubt that the media do play a crucial um, part in, in all of this in terms of influencing public attitudes and behaviour, but certainly not in a simplistic um, fashion by any means. Um, there's been less research attention that's been devoted to um, television as a source of um, people's information about what's going on um, in terms of, of climate change, which seems strange considering that um, when you ask people which news outlet they tend to trust the most, uh, we find that it tends to be television news. Um, and... Um, Broadcasters often steer clear of, of climate change. They see it often as being a, a political hot potato. Uh, Fox News, for example, um, in the run-up to um, Copenhagen, the managing editor um, emailed um, journalists to say that uh, they should immediately stop uh, talking about uh, climate change and the earth warming or cooling unless they mentioned at the same time um, that this was the subject of, of much debate and that actually we didn't really know what was going on. Um, but the book particularly focuses on um, online media and digital media, which as we know are becoming more and more um, influential, um, although you know, there are issues around credibility and, and trust. But again, um, you know, organisations like um, What's Up With That?, and um, other, um, you know, uh, <coughs> similar kind of organisation, climate change sceptics in, in the US have been very good at kind of exploiting um, the internet. And uh, you can see there that in the run-up to um, Copenhagen, there was a study that was carried out that focused on uh, what was going on in the US in terms of blogs. 
and um, they found a huge number of, of bl blogs on global warming um, and yet when they looked at the traditional press actually it was um, as you might expect the, the economy that was uh, the lead news um, item. Um, somebody already asked um, earlier on about who's um, got a smartphone here. We know that um, smartphones are becoming more and more um, popular. Blogging has taken off um, to a huge extent, but clearly there are major digital um, divides. And what I argue in the book um, is that as much as it's important to focus on how um, the media are framing particular environmental issues, including climate change, we also need to look at the struggle behind the scenes. So there's a fierce battle going on amongst news sources, um, environmental groups, for example, business, um, scientists and so on, to actually try and control the agenda before the story even hits the um, news editor's uh, desk. And there's also a much less visible side to power, um, you know, whereby um, not actually getting something to the media um, can be, you know, uh, really important to, to, so to actually silence issues as opposed to gaining uh, visibility. Um, and the book, um, Here Comes Everybody by Clay Shirky, paints a very optimistic <coughs> view of um, the internet, in my view, too optimistic. Um, there are downsides to you know, people just clicking on links, liking things. Actually, that's quite, quite a passive form of <coughs> engagement with the media. And maybe it creates the false impression that people are actually making real difference when you know, maybe they're, you know, they're, they're making a relatively minimal difference. Um, so just very quickly sum, out, sum up, because I'm out of time now. Um, I think there are lots of opportunities for collaboration in this area. In the past, researchers have focused much more on text rather than image. Um, and so there are all sorts of possibilities for doing research around environmental communication um, and visual aspects and also looking at new sources, strategies, and the role of the internet. So I'll end there, because I've run out of time. <laughs>